Presentation Skills for Design Students, Episode 11. Hello and welcome to Presentation Skills for Design Students, the podcast dedicated to helping design students everywhere become confident, creative communicators. My name's Christina Cantors, and I'm here to help you speak with confidence, create compelling presentations, and communicate your ideas like a rock star. So let's get to it. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. It's episode 11. I just decided to change my intro up a little bit. I think it's a little bit shorter, a bit more succinct. And I think I say presentation less times than in the old ones. So, so there you have it. New intro. Anyway, I must say this week in Melbourne has been, oh, we are in the middle of this ridiculous heat wave. It has been over 40 degrees every single day. And that's, that's 105 degrees Fahrenheit for all my awesome listeners in North America. One of my, I don't actually have air conditioning in my house, so what I've, what I've been doing is I've been wearing a wet T-shirt and then just putting the fan on me, and that actually works a treat. In fact, I reckon that would be, you know, a really great low-energy low housing solution, you know. Instead of giving, instead of installing air conditioning, you could give everyone portable fans and wet T-shirts. Problem solved. Now, I suspect I've probably killed off any potential uh, client interest in my architectural services. But anyway, today's show is very exciting because I am interviewing Dr. Peter Raisbeck, who is a well-respected lecturer at the University of Melbourne. Those of you who have studied there would have been taught by him at some point. He knows his stuff. And today we'll be talking about design presentations from a tutor's perspective and what and what they're really looking for and what really makes them tick. So so stay tuned for that. But of course, firstly I have a story from studio to share with you. And this week it's from Justin who studied at the Southeast University in Nanjing. And Justin's now an architect in Melbourne. So let's hear it from Justin. When I was in my university education, it was still very early, switching from the hand sketch to AutoCAD, and I, ne- I was never good at hand sketch. When I did my f- my bachelor in China, we all had this sketch kind of session, so we all have drawing boards where we go out and into the nature and start sketching stuff. And uh, it took me all afternoon, I couldn't sketch anything, and I think it's I was try to, I try to sketch a tree, right? And I was like, muffing around with my mates. At the end, I just drew a really dark patch and put a note next to it saying it's a tree. And my tutor like it, saying this is an architect. <laughs> Doesn't matter, nobody understand what's going on as long as you have, you have a note. <laughs> I think that that's what it is. Annotation is very powerful. Be careful what, what you put on the drawings. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Justin, for sharing that story. I remember actually having to draw trees in first year and I was hopeless. Hand drawing was not one of my strengths. And I do remember actually drawing a few dark blobs and I I wasn't clever enough to put an annotation on there saying tree. But I do remember my tutor coming up and trying to fix it for me, but to unfortunately to no avail. Now, if you would like to share your story, head on over to designdrawspeak.com slash story. Share with us. I'd love to hear what you what you learnt from uni. What's a what's a story where you learnt something or or something funny that a tutor said to you or some sort of aha moment that you had? That would be awesome. And I appreciate every single person who sends who is brave enough to send their story in. Okay, and now it's time to meet our special guest. And this week, it's Dr. Peter Raisbeck from the University of Melbourne. He's currently the coordinator of the master's program at the uni, and he'll talk more about his role in the interview. But here's the thing, Peter 
knows what he's talking about. He said so himself. He's seen a lot of student presentations. And today he's going to share with you a few little secrets about getting into the mind of your tutor. We, we met for a coffee on Ligon Street and had this chat. So if you've never been to Ligon Street, you'll definitely know what it's like now. There's a lot of doof doof cars and I will, I will give a prize to anyone who can tell me what the, the make and model of any of those cars that go past are. Anyway, he's got lots of great stuff to share. So I really hope you enjoy the interview. So let's get to it. I think you can learn presentation skills quite easily. I couldn't talk, I didn't talk till I was 30. And now I'm a very effective, I think, public speaker, but it's always something that you can um, improve upon and, and actually learn. And I think the best way to learn is to um, learn, learn from other people and see what other people do and think about the way that they have um, spoken in public and whether they're prepared or whether they're not prepared or, or how they actually deliver um, the messages that they want to deliver. Wow. Um, I, haven't even, I haven't even asked Peter any questions here. Now, is everyone listening? This is, <laughs> I'm sitting here at Brunetti's um, in Carlton with, with Dr. Peter Raisbeck from the University of Melbourne. And um, he's just clearly just very, very passionate about this subject. But hey, but before we dive into it, can you, can you just tell us more about your role at the university? Um, well, this year, last year and this year, I'm the coordinator of the Masters of Architecture program in the Melbourne School of Design in the Faculty of Architecture Building and Planning at um, Melbourne University. So essentially, um, I'm responsible for about 550 or 600 students in our um, Masters of Architecture program. So. Um, Part of our job, I think, is trying to build a, um, a design culture in the school, and I think a really important part of that is um, uh, communication and communication skills and imparting those to our students from different cultures. So what sort of cultures are there currently at the university? Um, well, we have people from every different nationality and um, a whole range of different cultures from um, Southeast Asia and certainly um, further afield, mixed in with um, Australian local students. So it's a very diverse group. And um, I think that means there are a lot of challenges in terms of um, teaching um, diverse groups of people within um, particular classes. But I think it's also a great opportunity to harness that diversity for good. Mm. And I think for me, I see my job this year is um, to really build up the design culture of the school. Last year we had a um, accreditation process, so I spent most of my time working on that, where we had the Architects Accreditation Council of Australia come into the school and give it the rubber stamp and say this school's okay and you know you can produce architects so that took up most of my time last year but this year I think my focus will be on um, trying to create a better um, culture and design culture within the school and creating a better student experience. Yeah. Now Peter you've seen a lot of student presentations, yeah, a lot. <laughs> I can, can you tell me? So many, and <laughs> <laughs> I am so over it because <laughs> I've got to tell you, Christina, that ninety percent of them are the same, and it's and and I just fall asleep because I've seen thousands of them. I can't even tell you how many I've seen, and you know when you see one that is different, or when you see one that is customised. Um, for the project that's been talked about or when you see one that obviously the person has um, done some preparation which I think is a really important thing you know it's just like it's such a relief 
to see that someone actually kind of cares. I mean, it makes an enormous difference. So what's the main thing that those students have done to make them stand out from the others? <laughs> I think preparation is one thing. I think um, explaining their work not simply as a description of the work that they've done or a description of their journey, but explaining their work more as a critical argument. Why have they done it like this? Um, you know, what, what is the rationale for their concept? What is the rationale for the particular design methods and um, tactics that they've used? Not just simply, oh, I woke up in the morning and the tutor <laughs> gave me the brief and we went down to the site and, and, you know, oh, yeah, I had a bit of an idea and I thought this about the site and then so the next week I... Um, designed some rooms and spaces around the side and then I got this you know, I mean 90% of people will just tell us the story of their journey throughout the semester and then at the end, you know, finally once you've got to the final point, you know, they get about 10 minutes, 5 minutes or you know, some two thirds of the way into their talk and then they finally say, and the concept is this <laughs> and you know you're sitting there you already know what the concept is because you've already been looking at the drawings you don't need to hear the whole journey you don't need to hear the whole narrative you don't particularly you don't particularly want to hear um, um, you know a description of the building oh the stairs are here the lifts are here you know most design critics can see those things on the journey you know most design critics are more interested in you know, the, the, why the design is the way it is and they want to talk about the big issues in relation to the design, mm. not the nitty-gritty stuff. And the sooner you can get to the big issues in your talk, the better, you know, because I say to people, just say, here's your name and here's your concept and then go for it. Don't tell us the whole journey of um, your semester because that's really boring. And often the journeys are quite similar because if, if all the students in one class are all doing the same project, of course they're all going to have gone to the site. Of course they're all going to have thought yeah. about it. Of course they're all going to have done some evaluation. Yeah, no, I think the exciting thing is if you go straight to the concept and talk about that first and structure your talk around the concept of, of your design, that's much more exciting and it's actually much more... You know, it's something that you can really own and take responsibility for and, and, and argue its worth. Because when I went to architecture school, I was taught by hard, 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 brutal men. And, um, you know, if you said the wrong thing, they would, they would you know, humiliate you pretty quickly. And, um, you know, it was really terrifying to face up to these people. Now, of course, we live in enlightened times now. Um, but... So how is it different now? One of the, how one of the, well, I now? think, well, you know, they can't be so, <laughs> can't be so mean these days when you get into trouble. That reminds me of uh, another question that I'd like to ask you, actually. Yeah. Uh, um, with everyone I interview on the podcast, I like to play the two things game. Have you heard of the two things? No. Well, it's based on the idea that for any subject or topic, you can, you can sum it up in only two things. And yeah. anything else is just an application of those two things, or it's just not important. So one example that I got uh, could be the two things about project management. Number one, the schedule will slip. And number two, it's about how you manage the schedule slippage. Yes. So just two <laughs> things about a topic. So what I'd like to ask you is, what are the two things that you really need to know about design tutors? <laughs> Design tutors. Mm. Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? That's taking me back a long way because I've spent most of my life being a design tutor, so I've probably had more experience as a design tutor than as a student. <laughs> <laughs> as a design student. I think you need to know... Um, what what is it that they, what are they what are they really interested in about architecture? 
what makes them passionate about architecture? I, I guess that's probably the first thing, you know, at a, at, a, at a bigger picture level. Is it, you know, they want to make the world a better place? Whatever it is, I think you need to understand where they're coming from in the sense of, you know, what is their edu- architectural educational background? What have they done? Are they in practice, you know, what's their overall motivation? So I think that's probably the first thing. What, what is their motivation to be an architect and to teach architecture? And I think the second thing is probably related to that, but it's a little bit more detailed in as much as given their motivation um, to do architecture, what are the things that they're really interested in at present? What is it that they're working on? What are, what are the architectural issues in um, you know contemporary world that, that they're interested in? Is it something to do with digital architecture? Is it something to do with housing? Is it, is it something to do with... Um, um, creating architecture for different um, um, cultural groups is it something to do with, you know, creating an architecture that is essentially um, poetic? Is it is it an interest in architectural language itself? So, I think all architects um, and certainly all the design tutors that we have in the school um, do have those um, particular interests, which are really about. I suppose contemporary architectural problems. So I think that would be the second thing that you would want to um, um, try and uh, figure out is firstly what are their broader motivations, and then secondly what are the real architectural problems or issues that they're working on at, at the moment, and that will depend a bit on what kind of practice they're running. Wow! Well, and if you know that. those two things. <laughs> Then, then in the studio you can start to engage yeah. with them on their level because you've then got a common, um, you understand, you know, what, what you, you can then, you know, learn, you've, you've got a common language or you've got common ideas, you can start to tap into those ideas and um, understand where, what it is, where, where they're coming from and um, start to develop a rapport with them. I really wish I knew that when I was studying. Some, well, I just it's not something I thought about because we're so caught up in ourselves and our own work and our own designs and especially as a student, you're so immersed in your project. And I think thinking about what does... It, we just tend to think about what we want all the time. And yeah. I think if I had paid more attention to what made my tutor tick and what really... Yeah. Have well, got them I, interested. Yeah. I think and I that mean, would have helped yeah. me a lot. And I look, I think that is a you know, working out what makes you two to tick for architects is for young architects, I think is a really effective way to learn. And that's how I learned because um, when I was at architecture school I um, had one design tutor or one architect for three studios. And that really enabled me to understand um, what made this particular person tick. And it also meant that I could um, engage uh, with him um, about the problems that he was interested in and the architectural issues that he was interested in, which, you know, in a way also became um, my own interests. Yeah. And I was able to, you know, I mean, in an ideal world, you can say, well, I can see that you're really interested in low-cost housing and I can see your take on low-cost housing as something to do with, um, you know, um, sustainable materials, whatever that might be. But you could say to him or say to your tutor, well, actually, I'm also interested in low-cost housing, but I think I've got a slightly different take, which might be more about, um, you know, using prefabrication or industrialised processes to achieve the same end. So you can then set up, by understanding what it is your tutor's interest in, you can then, you know, start to engage with that and set up, you know, alternatives and have a, a real discussion um, with them about their own interests and how that might relate to your own interests and what, what you think. And I think by doing that, you're then actually doing, you know, architectural research. Mm. That's if awesome. That makes sense. That's awesome. 
but <laughs> I mean, our, our, the tutors that I the tutor that I had the tutors that I had they, they would just beat us up anyway. <laughs> Whatever we said was bad because they were very much old school. So. Um, Hopefully there's not too many old-school tutors like that around. No, and I think in our course we're trying to develop a, um, a culture of design criticism, um, which I think is essential to a robust design culture. And, and part of that is, um, you know, working out ways to be able to um, talk critically about each other's work and, and to accept criticism and to use that and... In, and in, uh, to use that in your own design processes in, in a way that is, um, um, you know, respectful and not, not about humiliation or bastardisation. And um, I think um, there are people at our school and tutors and um, my good friend Professor Bates, Donald Bates, is he, I mean, he is a master at being able to sit down in front of a, a student's work and um, just, you know, go straight for the jugular and, you know, the essential points and um, criticise them in a way that is um, extremely inappropriate. My problem is I tend to lose patience <laughs> and I'll just go for the jugular <laughs> without being too polite about it. But certainly, um, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to do is to develop a, um, a, a design culture around... Um, you know, robust design criticism. Mm. Now, one last thing I'd like to talk about, Peter, yeah. just real quickly, is what what difference does a good presentation make in terms of the final outcome for a student? It could be anywhere between 10 and 20 marks. You could have a crap, I shouldn't say that, you could have a really, you know, a project that a student has struggled with and, you know, a, 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 you know because of their skills or wh- whatever it is, and it's not as good as other students in the group, but through a really well-prepared um, presentation, um, it, it can make a big difference. And um, it could be the difference between um, 10, 10 and 20 marks. Certainly, um, if your work in um, quantitative terms is borderline, if it's you know almost one grade to another grade, if you've done a good presentation, then... Um, Tutors and um, design critics will tend to put you up, and and it does it does make a big difference. There's nothing worse than seeing someone stand up with a good project that is really good and doing a bad presentation. Um, people will always warm to people who've done. Um, projects that may not be so great um, but they've really tried hard in terms of doing the presentation really prepared for it and and you know because I think that then gives the impression that this person has really tried mm. and, and I think that's a really important thing um, and then people will be sympathetic to your view yeah so I, I think that's what I would say does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It's, um, it's, it's, it's good to know. I mean, because a lot of... I think a lot of students just don't think that the presentation is important. They think, well, I've done the work, that's done, you know, I, and then they get the to the end of semester. The presentation is the most important <laughs> thing you can do at the end of semester. Wow, and, there you go. Um, you know, honestly... <laughs> I mean, and I mean, you know, the verbal presentation and certainly the graphic presentation... Just doing the work and sitting up all night and sitting on your computer and, you know, printing everything out at the print room and then when it comes out of the printer thinking, well, that's it. No, I am sorry. It is not it because, um, you know, standing up and talking about your work and um, presenting it in public um, to other critics and offering it into, or, or, you know, placing it into a design um, culture and design discourse is actually the most important thing. It really, I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's in some ways it's more important than doing it. And I think the trap that a lot of students fall into, and it's certainly one that I fell into and still fall into, is 
thinking by just, you know, working, 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 working on your computer, working, working, and not thinking about anything broader or outside of that means, and putting a lot of work in means that it's, you know, because you put so much work into it, it's going to be good. No, sorry. <laughs> because it might be a really good project, but you explain it badly and, and other people don't get it. I think so, that comes back to um, one of the fundamental things about communication and that, that is the meaning of your message is the effect that it has. So if you can't quite communicate your message and your ideas about your design, then you're really not going to make much of an impact on whoever's listening, whether that be your tutor yeah, or fellow right. students your, um, or down right. the track your clients or whatever. And look, I, I don't think you have to be good at English. I don't think, I mean, certainly with the diverse student cohort that we have you know you, you don't have to say a lot you, you don't have to be great you know at English if you've got good drawings there that communicate things that are well laid out you know and and you you know you, you can be brief I think and you just tell people what your concept is what the meaning of your concept is what are the big ideas that you're interested in um, you know, often that's that's more than enough than just telling us, you know, an unedited stream of conscious version of your entire journey through the semester. So you don't you don't have to say a lot, um, but you know, preparation I think is is key. I mean, when I have to do really big public speaking engagements, I I and it's important for me to do well. I might practice my lines maybe, you know, six or seven, seven times. So, yeah. you know, yeah. um, that's awesome. All right. Very, thank, thanks so much for sharing your 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 tutor design tutor's perspective. It's really yeah, great to well, hear hear that that point of view, Peter. So to be a good student, you just have to do what your design tutors say. <laughs> <laughs> Not as they do. <laughs> uh, no, thanks no, so much. Thanks so much for joining me, Peter. It's been right. it's been a pleasure. Great, thanks. Thank you so much to Peter Raisbeck for sharing all his really valuable advice with us. I think that's such awesome advice to just really get to know your tutor and, and find out what what it is that that really makes them tick and what what they're really passionate about in terms of design. And leading on from that, I'm I'm going to use that as inspiration for the challenge of the week. And this week, what I'd like you to do is to practice stepping in to someone else's shoes and looking at things from their point of view. So just as you might speak with your tutor and looking at it from from their perspective, when you're out in your day-to-day activities and you're speaking to someone, try and understand where they're coming from. So maybe it's maybe it's a really busy waitress at your local cafe or maybe it's a colleague at work or your boss at work trying to give you instructions and you're having a hard time. Or maybe your housemate or your partner comes home and they're really grumpy and you get annoyed at them. Try and put yourself in their shoes and see things from their perspective. And maybe that'll help. With you, with you understanding each other and improving the lines of communication. So give that a go. And if you do, I'd like to hear about it. Feel free to share your comments and your stories uh, in the show notes at designdrawspeak.com slash 011. All right, and that just about wraps it up for episode 11. Thanks so much for tuning in. I, I really hope you got something out of this week's interview. Now, if you've enjoyed this podcast and you want more people to find out about it, I know I do, head on over to iTunes and leave a review and rating there for the podcast. You can just search for Design Draw Speak or go to designdrawspeak.com and follow the links there to iTunes. I would be really, really appreciative more iTunes reviews means that more people get to discover the podcast. I hope you have a fabulous week. And if you're in Melbourne, I hope that you're surviving this heat wave. Okay. 
Make sure to get your wet towel or your wet t-shirt on. Believe me, it helps. This has been Presentation Skills for Design Students, helping you become a confident, creative communicator.